This is red sourcing, cyber war on a budget. Uh, and I should get the clicker, here we go. I'm Nick Carr. And I'm Christopher Glyer. And we spend our careers watching adversaries on the front lines. Occasionally we get the opportunity to talk about it and we do a little show, uh, State of the Hack. Um, but we, uh, we, we noticed some other things. There's a trend we've been noticing for quite a while. It's actually been referenced in a few of the other talks here. But we've, we've coined it as uh, red sourcing. This is referring to uh, espionage programs and nation state operators, you know, CNO operators, that are outsourcing their development of their tools and their techniques to the offensive security industry. So uh, we talked about it in lots of different ways of how we could present this Gartner Magic Quadrant style. And uh, I was an economics ma or minor in college, and so I really like supply and demand curves. And um, what we thought of was if you look at you know, adversary costs in terms of time and money and resources, uh, versus their capability, and you plot that on a graph, you would expect that the more uh, resources that you put into something in terms of cost, the, the more capability you'll have, but you'll have diminishing returns over time. So what we thought about was that kind of maps to resource efficiency and how do you gain a, a, as much resource efficiency as you can as a team. Red sourcing is a way that you can do that. So a decade ago, if you think about threat actors and who we were tracking, the majority of the tools they used were uh, you know, custom developed. There were you know, a couple you know, examples of them using red source tools like PW dump and LSA dump and other ones here and there, but it was very much the exception than the rule. Whereas now we see uh, threat actors use you know, majority of their toolkits or certain ones use the majority of their toolkits, which are, if you flip to now, um, majority of the toolkits in, in many cases we'll talk about today are actually red sourced and then they only spend custom cycles where needed, either where tools don't exist uh, or to focus on specific either detection, evasion, or, or something else. And we're broadly talking about cost to mean money and time. Yep. And so what that's done is that's changed both, uh, it's lowered the barrier of entry to get into the game if you want to be a, a cyber operator, either as a nation state or a financial criminal. Uh, it's also made it so that for the same amount of resources from, say, a decade ago, you can have significantly more capability today. Uh, and part of that's because of the increase in additional red source tools as well as the um, full featured nature of them. You know, I, did, I, I got my start in the cybersecurity business 15 years ago doing pen testing and things like you know, free full backdoor frameworks didn't exist. When we did internal pen tests, you'd go physically to a site, plug in a laptop and you'd conduct your tests from there. That's very different than now where you actually have like full phishing frameworks with backdoors and everything else that, to really emulate a threat actor. Um, and so you know, bad guys are using those same tools as well uh, for a multitude of reasons. Okay, so what do attackers do with this additional saved resources? I can't present without talking about APT32 uh, based out of Vietnam, and actually just a specific uh, ministry within Vietnam, and a group there that uh, are really early adopters of red sourcing. Uh, and so the kinds of things that they do, they cover domestic issues, it's really where they got their start, and where the emerging class of middle income countries building their CNO capabilities are focusing. Um, and, and these other nation states is monitoring its citizens, tracking journalists, conducting law enforcement, then some corporate oversight and compliance Ac accounting stuff, audits, audits, and then um, you know spy stuff. On spy stuff, remember you don't need to buy stuff to do spy stuff. And so, uh, if you want a great example of that, Chris Bing wrote an article about a stolen Trump uh, Duterte transcript where they're talking about uh, North Korea. It's pretty spicy. Uh, it was actually tied to an APT32 story where they were taking classified documents and weaponizing them, but that leaked out, came out via the intercept. Anyways, people seem to like Trump uh, uh, phone transcripts these days, so don't, don't sleep on that. All right, so what do these actually look like? I want to focus on um, the 2017 area, uh, uh, arena when we first started talking about this. We started to see APT32 broaden their mission set into that other category. Um, so these are a snapshot of their tools then and when we put out our blog about them. So. Uh, it's a little bit small, I apologize, but uh, you know they have some of their custom tools. They have really cool things. TCP, DNS, ICMP-based backdoors, but they rarely used those. They began to leverage all of these um, publicly released techniques primarily. They, they use less tools, more techniques. Um, and any time they would get pressure, any time we'd be able to slow them down or stop them on various engagements, they would just switch and roll to another technique. You're able to pretty easily tie those back to where they were finding those, and those were from Twitter. Now, I don't, we don't want to make it seem like Twitter's the problem, maybe a separate problem, but not this problem. Um, APT, the difference here is um, APT32 is just paying attention. We had an engagement where we couldn't figure out how APT32 deployed their malware to tons of different systems uh, all at once, 
and it turns out they actually deployed um, Cobalt Strike Beacon, the trial version of a, a commercially available red teaming framework. Um, they deployed it to all these systems, and it turns out they um, owned the client's McAfee EPO, which is used to push out, and they use the software deployment task, like this security tool, to deploy their back door everywhere. So we were able to tie that back, though, to this abandoned security research project that was put out on GitHub, and they leveraged that same technique. So they do it through all things. They find some really creative stuff. So this is CyberWorkCon. I thought we were here to talk about CyberWork. Okay, that's fair. So I look back at what we're uh, supposed to submit about. So how about information operations? So um, uh, we're not. So there are some pretty entertaining Vietnamese, maybe information operations, but we're not talking about the Twitter stuff discrediting me, although it's, it's pretty valid. Um, we're actually talking about on, a no, on um, at least one engagement we were involved in. APT32 has observed collecting those in, that information for their sort of audits of private corporations doing business there and selectively leaking those out to the public uh, to, it, to change public opinion of, um, of that corporation. So a little bit into the information operations arena. All right, so if you've got cyber war, I think I can do you one better from, a, from an I.O. perspective. So uh, the group, uh, you know, the, the malware has, has many names. Hatman is my favorite. Uh, it was, it's also been called Trisis or Triton. Um, but the group behind the, uh, the you know, large industrial control system targeting of uh, safety instrumented systems, um, Nick and I actually helped out in the back end of that investigation. And so I want to talk about kind of how they leverage uh, red sourcing as well. So if you look at the tools they had, in the early phase of the attack lifecycle, and almost all the way through the end, almost all of their tools were either freely available or red sourced. Um, a lot of their back doors were, uh, they used open frameworks or open tools like PLink or CryptCat or Bitvise. Um, and then they, they uh, layered in a few other red source ones. And then only at the last stage did they really deploy some custom tools. And obviously that's where they spent the bulk of their effort is on the Tri Triton ICS uh, malware framework. Uh, shout out, there's also the, uh, uh, Steve Miller's running a uh, charity, charity, charity event right now, an auction that'll Triton end book, tomorrow. Available on Triton Twitter. Book. Uh, so if you guys wanna, wanna contribute Signed by to our a big good boss, cause, uh, Kevin. Uh, all, all donations go to uh, wisp.org. Uh, so they also, uh, from a tradecraft perspective, um, they picked up, uh, you know, there was this uh, blog that may have got a little bit of attention from a security company called Cybellum, and about six weeks after this new persistence mechanism was discussed, among other things in this blog, they actually picked it up and used it in the wild. So really interesting seeing threat actors paying attention to what's being out and then leveraging it either to help uh, detection evasion uh, or in this so case. You can, you can read about the murky Russian laboratory behind this. We have a, a blog on it, but the point is, to deploy Triton, they were leveraging these techniques. We didn't know what they were, and we were able to tie them to a uh, red source thing. Okay, so a uh, shout out to Andrew Thompson here for the trash sticks. Uh, we can't, uh, that's pretty good, but that wasn't that destructive, right? So let's talk about a group that's been destructive. People have talked about them a little bit here. If you're uh, aware of their greatest hits, including things like Shamoon, you might uh, be interested in APT32. These guys are some of the most notorious red sourcers. We actually just see them roll through a number of publicly available frameworks. In this particular campaign we wanted to talk about, the recent uh, uh, campaign from end of 2018 till mid-2019, where they were just deploying destructive malware, they relied on um, Puppy Rat, you can pronounce that however you want, uh, Posh C2, Empire, and stuff like that. One of the most interesting things they relied on is Ruler, which is a, a tool released by SensePost. SensePost uh, uh, you know, properly disclosed it, got CVEs, got things fixed, but the point is, uh, it, they relied on this, uh, they used it a lot, and actually um, they're, they're so, still using it today. It's not well known, and uh, it's been pretty successful. So don't take our word that 33 is using it. Cyber Command also uh, publicized the, uh, the CVE yep. uh, for Ruler. Uh, so uh, fringe benefit, and we're almost done. Um, two different threat actors we love to track, which are on the more resource side. Uh, APT28 did close access operations at multiple different locations, one in the hospitality industry as well as at the uh, chemical uh, 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 related to the scripples. They uh, were physically proximate. They deployed a tool called Responder to basically sniff credentials to anybody connected to the Wi-Fi. Uh, 29 also used, uh, uh, in this case, a, a legitimate version of a Cobalt Strike Beacon or a, a licensed version uh, as part of their broad phishing campaign in 2018. Um, yeah, right. so just to wrap it real quick, uh, the incorrect takeaway is that red team research is the problem. Uh, the real point is to keep current on red team research and their tools and their techniques. If you focus your detection and collection on those things, on red sourcing, it's high threat density. You're gonna get the red teams, but you're also gonna get a lot of these emerging nation states that are upping their game. 
And just make sure you decouple uh, tools from attackers just because you see a red team tool doesn't necessarily mean it's a red team. Um, and it isn't just you know, emerging states that are benefiting from it. We see well resourced nation states using it to make attribution more difficult. Thanks. There's citations for all those.